with its opening. Uh, we'll have a lecture followed by um, a moderated Q&A. Uh, so we have mic runners uh, that will be kind of distributed across the room uh, to, to be taking your questions, right? Uh, so we'll kind of alternate across sides of the room to distribute uh, you have the actual uh, questions. Uh, we do ask that you speak into the mic uh, clearly, right? And also to keep your, your questions, you know, as sweet and short as possible, right? To allow everyone in the room a, an opportunity to, uh, to, to ask a question. Uh, secondly, we have a photographer, or I guess maybe a few photographers, uh, around the room who are going to be taking photos tonight for kind of public relations purposes. Uh, if you're not comfortable with having uh, your photo taken, uh, please do let one of the staff members know. Uh, then finally, washrooms are located out there, right? They're somewhere on the main floor on the other sides of the, uh, the, the two uh, stairways there. Uh, they're not in here, so please don't go searching uh, furiously for these during the, uh, the lecture, right? Uh, so in terms of the setting of the larger kind of purposes of the evening, uh, the goal of this annual event, right, is to disseminate knowledge, right, and further or foster discussion, right, by inviting leading experts in economics uh, to discuss their, you know, perspective and uh, experience in their area of expertise, right? So we've had many, you know, high-profile economists speak in the past, and this year, of course, is no different. Uh, we're very excited to have our guests uh, here tonight, Dr. Susan Athey. Um, <clears throat> but first, before her presentation, uh, we'd actually like to hear from uh, Landon Hoyt, who's the program manager uh, for SFU Public Square, who will provide some opening remarks in addition to, to mine. Right? So please join me in welcoming Landon uh, to the podium. Thanks, David. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here on this uh, gorgeous evening. I'm Landon Hoyt, the program manager at SFU Public Square. And for those of you that don't know who we are, um, SFU Public Square is a community engagement initiative of Simon Fraser University, uh, which basically means we collaborate and convene so that people can learn from and with each other and tackle some of today's most pressing social issues. And tonight, we're thrilled to be co-presenting uh, the BMO Public Lecture with Susan Athey. We're proud to say that this is the fifth uh, time we've worked with SFU's Department of Economics to co-host this event. And we were particularly excited about this year uh, once we learned that Dr. Athey's area of expertise. Back in February and March, we hosted our annual community summit, Brave New Work, which culminated 10 days of programming um, addressing the future of work. Hopefully some of you were able to make it out to some of those events. Um, <clears throat> tonight's conversation about digital intermediaries builds on the theme and we're really excited to learn more. So uh, I'll pass it back to David um, so we, we can get things underway. Okay, well, thank, thank you. you. All right. So uh, now we get to the, uh, the heart of the event, as it were. So uh, Simon Fraser University is, of course, pleased to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Uh, Dr. Susan uh, Athey. Dr. Athey is a professor at uh, the Stanford University Graduate School of Business, where she teaches the economics of technology. Uh, she completed her PhD at Stanford and holds an honorary doctorate from Duke University. Uh, she's had a very impressive and distinguished academic career, having taught at the economics departments of both uh, Harvard and MIT, in addition to Stanford. Uh, her research focus, as you'll get a taste of uh, for uh, tonight, is on the economics of technology and digitization, marketplace design, and machine learning, right? So her research has had an application in many very large topics in recent years, such as cryptocurrencies, news media, and online advertising. Um, <clears throat> In recognition of these kind of achievements, uh, in 2007, uh, she was awarded the uh, John Bakes Clark Medal, uh, which is a great honor, uh, one of the highest honors achievable in economics, second only to the Nobel Prize, right? Uh, what is more, right, it's not just, you know, that, uh, even more, she's been one of the, the tech economist pioneers, right? Uh, serving as a consulting chief economist for Microsoft Corporation for six years. Uh, she now serves on the boards of Expedia, uh, Ripple and Rover, uh, and in kind of a nod to kind of local content, 
Uh, she also serves as a long-term advisor to the British Columbia Ministry of Forests, designing and implementing uh, their auction-based pricing system. And so with that, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Susan AP. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. I'm delighted to be here, and it's a real honor to deliver this lecture. Um, so uh, I'm, tonight I'm going to be talking about the impact of digital intermediaries, and I'm really interested in the broader implications of all of the changes digitization has brought um, to our lives and, and our economy. And I'm, tonight I'm going to focus on uh, two areas that I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about. Um, one is the news media, and the other is ride sharing. And um, one of the, the uh, big, big kinds of themes about how all of these intermediaries work is that they don't just have sort of short-term implications, but they actually really affect the, the industry structure around them. And so we don't just you know, want to think in the short run, you know, how does Facebook decide what news I read today, but actually, I want to think about what news is even going to exist tomorrow um, when the world changes and, and people find their products in such a different way. So, you know, the new aggregators and intermediaries affect many, many aspects of markets. Um, the, they affect search frictions. So, you know, something like eBay and Amazon can allow me to access a, a vastly larger set of products and find exactly what I want. Um, and they can also allow me to do transactions that I couldn't do before. So, you know, it, of course, some, I always could have gotten a ride off the street, but it's pretty hard to maintain trust and figure out payments and, and coordinate in that setting. And so they've, th these reductions in frictions and the increase in trust and the ability to transact safely have enabled really an, a dramatic expansion of output. And things like reputations, reviews, and then some things that may be less obvious but w that are happening very much behind the scenes is that intermediaries are keeping track of how consumers like the, the experiences they're getting and how well service providers are performing which again can really increase allocative efficiency. Um, so the, all of these reductions and frictions, they sound um, you know, on the surface like they would be unambiguously good, like making markets work better, helping people find stuff, helping solve problems of trust and safety. But they in turn in, in will affect the incentives of firms like suppliers to even exist and change the structure of those markets. And one big theme is that, that these platforms will typically make it a lot easier for small suppliers to compete with large suppliers. And so we see that where, you know, in, in the old world, if I wanted to get a ride, I might hail a taxi or I could call a limo service. And there, there were some large limo services like Boston Coach and sort of medium-sized ones that would aggregate drivers they would put up an, an, a number you could call, you could, and, you could, and they would sort of aggregate the reservations and the coordination and the booking. Now, things like Uber and Lyft have put those sort of medium-sized companies out of business, more or less, say some of them still exist, but their market share has gone way down, because now the individual drivers can serve as their own entrepreneurs. And so it's a pretty complex environment when you think about it, because if you just think about the limo service as, a, as an aggregate, of course, you know, they may be unhappy about all of the entry, but an individual driver could be better off depending on what, how much of a cut the limo service was taking versus how much of a cut Uber is taking. And then, there, the, and then there's an additional change in market structure because, of course, you, the Uber started with the limo services but then went into UberX and this kind of lower and cheaper service, which, of course, puts a lot of downward pressure on the price of the limos. So, you know, therefore, an, an individual limo driver's fortunes might have gone up and then down just over the last, you know, eight years over the course of all, as all of this has, has played out. From an efficiency perspective, of course, you know, if I didn't actually need the limo, I just wanted somebody to show up at my door, then you know, I'm going to consume a lot more and output will, will go up. Um, 
the changes, another big change is the change in the dimensions of competition and the incentives for quality. So if you think about something like travel, you know, we, again, that's similar to the analogy of the limos, you might not be aware, but hotel chains, big hotel chains actually don't own hotels. There are, there are entrepreneurs, medium-sized entrepreneurs who own one or two or three or five individual hotel buildings, and then they have sort of a franchise agreement with the big hotel chains. Before we had any of these online intermediaries, the role of those brands was really important because if you wanted to go to a, get a hotel, you, know, you wouldn't really know what it was until you got there, but the brand would tell you about something about the quality of the, of the hotel. Um, in, the, in the world where we can shop online, we can actually get individual reviews from companies like TripAdvisor and so on, and so we can know not just, well, this is a Marriott, but we, we can know whether this is a good Marriott and whether this is a noisy Marriott and whether this is a Marriott that gives you food poisoning or not. And so now the hotels actually have to compete on a property by property basis, and the role of the brand in incentivizing quality um, goes down. So, the, and that, that in turn can affect the industry structure, and indeed, you know, the choice of an individual hotel to affiliate with a large brand or to remain independent can also be affected by the, by the availability of these kinds of intermediaries. And so they're winners and losers. Uh, from, from this world, and also changes in, in the consumer behavior. Potentially, you know, it's, a, it's much easier to actually get exactly the, the experience that you want as a consumer, which in turn increases the incentives of the properties to add that to you. Um, and we also can have effects on prices, because if it's easier for consumers to search, that in turn can reduce equilibrium markups and, again, it, uh, pass more welfare back to consumers. But as I'll talk about later, I, I think that you have to look at each of these, these um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Because if you think about something like news, a lot of these same types of phenomenon may not operate in exactly the same way. Um, we might actually, since, since articles only last about a day, you know, competing on an article-by-article -article basis may not be exactly the way we want competition to work. Um, and indeed, we might actually want a brand to play a role in terms of certifying the quality of, a, of an object. So whether it's sort of good or bad to have a, an intermediary, a, a middle-sized intermediary that aggregates suppliers and, and certifies their quality um, versus having consumers go directly to the producers, say going directly to a reporter on a particular article, whether that's good or bad w will depend on, on the circumstance. So I'm going to start out with the example from ride sharing. And this is a paper that's um, joint with Camilla Castillo, who's one of my PhD students at Stanford, and Dan Nuffel, who's a former PhD student from Stanford and now works in the public policy team at Uber. And, um, and actually, in uh, two of the three of the papers I'm going to present today are actually still in progress. So I'll probably, since I'm on video, I'll probably say this a couple of times, that empirical estimates are qualitatively um, correct, but we may still refine the analysis, change the sample, and do robustness checks. So please don't um, tweet or quote the very specific numbers um, it, 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 because they are uh, subject to, to change. So if I think about specifically, you know, digging more deeply into the case of a specific market, um, market design, again, has, has impacts on the entry of, of market participants, their composition, and their behavior. And so this is, these are themes, actually, that I've been exploring in research for a long time. We talked about timber. Um, again, I have a a, a long-lasting relationship with timber. I started working on timber auctions as a research topic when I was 17 years old um, in, in, in college, and I've been working on them ever since, uh, and particularly here in, in British Columbia. But some of the research that I did on U.S. Forest Service timber auctions was looking at how the design of a market affects who enters, and one of the things I showed there was that designing, um, designing markets uh, could in particular ways could really promote the entry of small firms which made the markets more competitive. And I basically showed that the way that pricing works um, in, a, in a conditional on entry has a, a negligible effect relative to the effect of the way that pricing works on who chooses to enter. 
and policies that, that were favorable to the entry of small bidders were very favorable also for auction revenue and thus how much the government got for its natural resource. Um, and that, that theme that came out of a lot of my early um, economics research, then I, I found to be even more important when I started working with tech companies um, and really discovered how changes in, 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 the, in the real world of, of the tech economy, how, um, how, how you design the marketplaces and how, much, how competitive you make them, how much you encourage the entry of smaller players, again, can um, really affect consumer welfare and, and firm profits. So the, the question then I'm going to talk about today is does enabling small suppliers help or hurt the equilibrium quality experienced by consumers? This is a pretty hard question to get at because a lot of times when we see the entry of an online intermediary, it actually sort of changes so much that I can't compare apples to apples in terms of like the old delivery and the new delivery. But I'm going to make use of a few kind of experiments or natural experiments in the data that allow me to try to pin this down for two specific cases. One of them is news, and I'm going to talk about how intermediaries affect the quality of the news you consume, and I'm going to show some evidence that it, they can hurt the factuality of news and generally redistribute consumers away from big news outlets to small news outlets, which can have if, the, if there's no reason that the small news outlets have to be worse, um, they could be better. But it, it, given the way the news industry works, that can be bad for welfare if the big outlets are the ones that are investing the most in, in investigative reporting and R&D. And it can also be a problem given that almost all of the, the fake news outlets are small. Um, I'm also going to talk about th this case of ride sharing, and there I'm going to make use of the fact that uh, we are able to actually observe directly the quality, one aspect of quality of rides, which is how safely the driver drives. And I'll be able to compare that across um, Ubers and taxis. So when I think about Uber specifically, you know, a key welfare benefit of the gig economy, and this is something that a bunch of other economists have very recently documented, including a very nice paper by Keith Chin, Judy Chevalier, and Peter Rossi. Um, one of the big benefits of the, the gig economy is that it's flexible. And so they've used various empirical strategies to, to, to show using the behavior of Uber drivers that those Uber drivers really get a big benefit from being able to work when they want to work. Okay, and that's one of the things I guess that you are depriving workers of here in British Columbia right now. Um, but the, the kinds of people that benefit from that are you know, students, um, people with part-time jobs, parents taking care of kids, people with unpredictable schedules. And so one of the big benefits is that you know, they may have a few hours where they, they're not, they can't predict what it's gonna be in advance, so they really have no other way to monetize that time but if they have a job that they can just turn on and off when they choose, they can then earn money during that time and supplement their income. So those kind of part-time workers uh, really benefit. But if I, there's also this concern that maybe these workers, especially the part-time workers, are, are somehow lower quality. And so we may have a trade-off um, between you know, the, the fact that because the opportunity cost of their time is relatively low, they're charging a relatively low price, so it's a low price service for consumers, um, but maybe it's also a, a less safe um, uh, uh, experience for consumers. And indeed, when we think about all of the taxi regulation and things we've had in the past, a lot of that was, was at least justified through consumer safety. Of course, some of it is also you know, rent protection for the people who, um, who own taxi medallions and often you know, the supply that's, that's created is less than maybe what a, a consumer-focused social planner would want, but nonetheless, uh, the consumer protection side had seemed important. And, and, and so this is one place where I think it's really interesting to just rethink, well, what would we do if we started the world today? So if we started the world today, would we really want to go out and have people study for a year and take a test to be a taxi driver? Would that be the best way to guarantee consumer safety? Or actually, would it be better to monitor them while they're uh, performing their services and actually make sure they do a good job while they're performing? And so this is actually this is an open theoretical question. 
is what makes a good taxi driver just something innate about the person, in which case we want to screen out the bad ones and get the good ones, or is it partly effort? Is it like it's not that hard to drive a car? Um, and we really just need people to practice a little bit, but then really just have put in high effort. And so if we think about the current system, if, it, if effort and attention was what's more important, the taxi system doesn't provide great incentives there. So how many people have ever had a taxi ride that made them feel a little bit uncomfortable about their safety? And so can you keep your hand up if you called someone about it? Wow, that's pretty good. Um, you are a very socially minded, public good minded person to protect all the rest of us from your dangerous taxi driver. Um, most people do not, and I think part of them as, as rational economic actors, they anticipate that that phone call might not actually result in any effect besides the fact that it actually takes them from trouble to do. And so our current system, you know, that, that system of screening up front and then basically letting people do whatever they want as long as they don't do anything too egregious um, doesn't necessarily provide the best incentives for behavior. And so broadly, I would say that um, we, should, we're, we, should, we're gonna, we should expect to see a transformation across our economy as we move to much greater observability of the quality of services away from occupational licensing and upfront testing and towards um, observation and auditing uh, and, 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 and service provider by service provider incentives. So broadly, what we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna try to um, expect those things can happen, but we need to measure them. I mean, who knows which is more important in a particular context, we need to actually measure them. And marketplaces are different in a whole bunch of ways. They're going to have feedback, but also there's other aspects that may be hard to, to separate out, like the, your driver interacts with you more in an Uber, so you get to know them. Maybe they feel more accountable for you. Maybe they care more about you because they're getting to know you, and so on. Um, I'm not going to be able to separate that, but I am going to just compare everything that's different about an UberX, which is when it's an individual car, against a taxi in terms of safety. And so how am I going to do that? Well, I'm not going to look at safety in terms of somebody mugging you or somebody, you know, uh, which in a developing country can be a really big deal. In, in developed countries, this is less of a big deal. I'm actually going to measure safety in terms of things that make you likely to have an accident. And I'm, and I'm going to try to ask whether Uber drivers provide, just drive their cars more safely. So how am I going to do that? I'm using data from the city of Chicago where um, as, as one of the responses that various taxi companies have had to the entry of things like Uber is that they are using apps themselves to dispatch the taxis. And so in the city of Chicago, to try to get to market more quickly with this, Uber actually made an agreement with the taxi dispatchers. And so a taxi can actually be dispatched through the Uber app. So you can choose whether you want you know, Uber Black, Uber X, or Uber Taxi is another option. And so we're gonna get data from here and we're going to compare the rides. And I'm gonna make use of the fact that the Uber app actually monitors the driver while they are driving. And you might not know this, and hopefully this will make all of you drive more safely as well, but your cell phone is capable of understanding everything about how you drive. The cell phone can tell if you pick it up, if you text it, and they can tell the difference between that and slamming on the brakes. It can tell the difference, it can tell if you have a fast acceleration, a hard brake, a swerve. It can tell your speed. Okay, your, 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 all of your phones are capable of doing all of that at very high degree of accuracy. And as long as the Uber app is open, whether it's a taxi or a, an Uber, those uh, statistics are being monitored. Um, and that's the data I'm going to use to compare directly the quality of the rides. And so this is a really nice example because it's apples to apples. You're getting transportation from point A to point B, and I can directly measure with the same measurement device the two different um, kinds of vehicles. So it's just some other key facts. The financial incentives, taxis relative to Ubers. Taxis have a higher base fare. The charges per minute and per mile are each about 2x for taxis than Ubers. Um, so this is, of course, partly why uh, consumers like it. It's nice to have something at, at half the price. 
Um, the quality incentives on Uber, so the, the, what the driver sees is a rating in the app, which is the average of their last 500 rides, as well as the most recent rating that a consumer gave them. So they see, oh, on average, I've got a 4.8 star rating, and my last ride was, you know, a 4.9. It was, was a 5. I'm sorry, you can't give points. Um, you then have rating-based incentives, as well as I'm, in a, I, I'm currently in process of analyzing a randomized experiment they ran where they gave safety nudges and warnings, which our preliminary results show that those actually had a substantial impact on make, nudging drivers to drive more safely. Um, but I won't show you the numbers on that today because that's still in progress. Although low ratings and complaints are relatively uncommon, poor driving and slow driving are actually among the more common complaints. And so one of the things that's um, kind of slowed down us giving our final numbers is that people's preferences about speed of driving are actually non-monotone. Therefore, getting the right functional form and analyzing things very carefully around speed is, is delicate. And so we've try, actually tried to expand our data set size and make sure that we were, we're handling speed appropriately. Um, this is a distribution of ratings. So most people get five-star ratings. Um, and this is, I'm sorry, from slightly older data than the rest of the data in the paper, but it, it hasn't really changed very much. Um, the incentives that drivers get, if your rating, if your last 500 rating goes below 4.6, you get a warning. If it goes below 4.5, you get another warning. If you go below 4.4, you're temporarily deactivated and you have to take a course. Um, then you can come back. But if you go down again, then you're permanently kicked off the system. Now, what's interesting is that not very many people fall into these low ratings buckets. And so one of the interesting puzzles that this paper is going to give some results, but it's also going to raise some questions that I can't completely answer, is like, why are the Uber drivers driving safely? And it's actually not really going to be because they're worried about getting kicked off. Um, how, how, how would some way to quantify that? Well, I looked at the, the fraction of drivers that are at risk from falling below the different thresholds if they hypothetically got the next in consecutive trips as a three-star rating. And it's pretty hard to get a three-star rating, as I just showed. Not many ratings are three-star. So the event of getting, like, say, 20 three-star ratings in a row would be highly unusual. And so if you look at take every driver, imagine tacking on, you know, um, 23 star ratings, your last 500, there's only still, uh, you know, about 2% of drivers who would be at risk of falling before the deact below the deactivation threshold if they had such a very bad string of ratings. And for these higher thresholds, there's a few more people, but there's, it's really just, there's not that many drivers that are actually really directly incentivized from getting kicked off. So they're incentivized by something else, and a hypothesis would be that it's that actually just the information is, is a big uh, part of it. So here's what really like the, the main result, and I do this a bunch of different ways for the academics in the room, but it, for the non-academics, you can just focus on the circled thing. Um, but let me, let me tell you the, what this number that I've circled means. That number is telling me if I compare an UberX trip and an Uber taxi trip, how much better is the UberX trip? And I'm going to try to control for the different aspects of the trip in a couple of different ways. But this particular way is a matching way. So I'm basically going to take a trip, and there's an origin for the trip, a destination for the trip, and an hour of the week, like is it Monday at 9 o'clock. And for every Uber taxi dispatch, I'm going to find the closest UberX trip in terms of those three dimensions and match it to that. And I have a much smaller number of Uber taxi dispatches than I have Uber X. I have millions of Uber X trips, but only you know, a couple hundred thousand Uber taxi dispatches. And so I'm going to focus on the Uber taxis and then find the closest Uber X trip. And when I use that matching approach, I find that the Uber Xs are safer. Now, what are the units for this? Well, there, this is actually pretty complicated because I have about um, 10 different metrics that describe what happened in that car trip. But some of them, you know, how do I know how important they are? How do I know how important it is that somebody had a hard break or a hard acceleration? And so in order to aggregate up all these things that I measure about a trip, what I do is I create an aggregate score that is scaled in terms of how much the consumers liked that trip. And so it's basically the predicted star rating as a function of all of the characteristics. 
And so, I, and so if consumers don't like hard brakes, but they don't mind hard accelerations, then a, a trip that has a lot of hard brakes will get a lower score in this way. And actually, the whole theory of how you create these scores is something that comes up a lot in tech firms, and I've, I've got a statistics paper about this as well. But here I'm just, I'm just pull, calling up this score. And now I also have three scores. I have a full score. I have a score that is ba just based on the speed of the trip, and I have a score that ignores speed. And that's because speed is actually kind of this funny variable um, that has, where you have non-monotonic preferences about it. And so what this is showing is with the, all the different ways I can measure and with all the different ways I can construct these scores, UberX is safer than taxis. Um, then I can also just try to understand, and here's an example of some of the different metrics that I use, I can try to understand, well, really what's driving the scores, just to try to understand a little bit better what's going on here. And what I do is I decompose the variance of all of these different metrics into the driver effects, the rider effects, and the trip characteristics. And so one of the things that's actually kind of interesting about the scores is that the, 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 the ratings that the riders give actually have a huge um, rider fixed effect. So some riders like give everybody five stars and some riders give a lot of people one stars. And those, those, score, those ratings people give are, are kind of constant across people and they actually explain a lot of the overall ratings that a driver gives. So actually a driver is subject to a lot of risk um, by, to, of what rider that they actually draw. But for all these other things, other than the ratings, most of the variation in, in is due to the driver, and actually a relatively small amount to the trip, which should, I have all these different ways of trying to control for trips, but actually it should suggest that you know, the driver is really a lot of what's going on in terms of the safety of the ride. Um, now, when I try to uncover why they're driving more safely, one of the things that, that I hypothesized was that they're responding to incentives. But yet I've already told you that those incentives don't really seem to be playing a major role. So one more, other way to get at why they're trying to perform better is to say, well, how, how would a, a, a driver respond to a shock that lowered their rating? And so one kind of shock they can get is that they are exposed to a rider that gives lots of one stars. And so that would sort of exogenously lower their rating outside of the driver's control. Another thing is they could be driving in an hour that just made everybody unhappy. So it's like raining and there's a traffic jam and just all the, all the customers are unhappy. So what I do is I use a couple of empirical strategies where I basically think of that, those as experiments that are being done on the driver and look at the effect of these experiments of getting a low rating for reasons outside of the driver's control. And so what I find, and this is a circled red numbers, is that if your last rating was low, then the driver is going to drive in a way that increases their next rating. And so getting a bad rating before makes them work harder to make a better trip. But interestingly, they do not respond in terms of safety in any kind of significant way. So if they get a bad rating, they're like nice, maybe they clean up their car, they smile and talk, but they don't actually respond in terms of the safety of their driving. So it seems like maybe they, they actually understand that that's not the most important thing to the consumer and that's not the easiest way to make the consumer happy, which again suggests that it's not directly the incentives that are driving, the, that are responsible for their behavior. Um, then in terms of understanding a little more the behavioral economics of it, here I look at how does the driver's behavior in terms of ratings and in terms of safety change when they get warnings. And so you can get warnings if, if your ratings fall below certain levels. You also get notifications as soon as those warnings, you're, you're out of the bad territory and you're back into the good territory. And so something that's kind of interesting is that the Uber drivers respond by behaving better whether they've gotten into a warning threshold or whether they've come out of a warning threshold, which sort of suggests that actually what's really driving them is just the information. Like they're being reminded that people are watching them and that's making them behave better, but it's not actually like the financial incentives that's, that's driving things. So in terms of just to kind of sum up what my, my, my conclusions are here is that we're finding that UberXs are substantially higher quality than taxis in terms of safety metrics. But the story that I might have liked to tell, that this is all because of the great incentives provided by the marketplace, the kind of the purely economic story, doesn't seem to really be explaining all of it. And it's, it may be more of a behavioral economic story about the information or about the interaction with the passengers than, um, than purely economic incentives. 
And what we're, and then as, as I mentioned, in ongoing work, Uber was running experiments where they gave drivers information about safety that was not tied to incentives, and that also seems to improve their safety behavior. But that may be a, just a more general phenomenon that actually people want to do a good job, um, but they're really not getting a lot of feedback when they're doing a bad job, and getting feedback can actually help even if you don't financially penalize them, which is maybe a, a good thing about a world where we're going to monitor more. Now let me move on and talk about news, and I'm going to talk about a couple of papers I've written on news. So in a, a, one of the reasons I got interested in this is I, I worked in the search engine at Microsoft for a number of years, and there was this basic fact, which, which was obvious to anybody who worked in a search engine, but wasn't actually obvious to outsiders, which is that search engines have an enormous amount of control over what you do. Um, and so we ran this experiment, which was actually commissioned by the European Commission when they were investigating Google for search manipulation. And so the European Commission said, well, hey, you know, we have some documentary evidence that Google manipulated results to favor Google's products and services, but we don't really think this would matter very much. Because, you know, I understand search costs in the physical world, but how much of a search cost could it really be to roll your eyeballs up and down a page? Like, that just doesn't seem like a big deal. And I was like, well, of course it's a big deal. Why do you think Bing spends billions of dollars on research to try to rank things well? Like, if it didn't matter how you ranked things, then, you know, a search, you wouldn't need the search engine to be a high-quality search engine. But, you know, they didn't believe me, so we ran a big experiment. Um, or rather, I should say, they believed me, but they didn't believe and know about the magnitude. And so what we did is we basically randomized for a couple million people the ranking of the search results and took things that were in the third position and put them in the first position and put thing, thing in the first position and the third position in the treatment group. And then the control group got the regular results ranked the way they should. And just to see what, what the impact of that was, um, this uh, dotted box is sort of the clicks that were lost by the thing in the first position when it was moved to the third position. So what this is saying is that if it, in the control group, the thing in the first position was clicked 25% of the time, but when I moved it down to the third position, it, was, it, it, it lost half of its clicks. If I moved it down to the fifth position, you know, it lost most of its clicks. If I put it in the tenth position, it hardly got clicked at all. And then we also showed that this was robust to measuring, you know, quick back clicks and how long people stayed and so on. So this was basically showing that manipulation of search results has a big consequence. So now why does this matter? Well, if you think about news, you're getting the same thing, right? A newspaper is, is, is showing one headline at the top and another one down here. Google News is showing one thing at the top and another thing down here. And that's actually going to have a pretty important impact on what people read. So we should then care a lot about the impact of, of these intermediaries for news. So just to say um, a little more about news, you know, if you think about how you find news, you, nobody goes out and actually types in a URL for a news article. So the only way you can find news is if some intermediary shows it to you. That intermediary might be NewYorkTimes.com, it might be Google, it might be Google News, it might be Facebook, but basically digital news must be found through some kind of a middleman. The articles have to be found that way. And so it's, um, so it's a particularly important to know about the role of curation. So the first paper is about the role of aggregators such as Google News, and it's really motivated by the fact that you know, digital news has grown, um, other news has fallen, um, ad revenue has declined substantially, and digital ad revenue has not kept up with, uh, with the, uh, the movement of the consumers to, digi to digital consumption. We've seen a big decline in the number of newspapers per 100 million people, and we've seen a decline in newsroom employment as well. So all of this is bad if we think this, these people help us keep our democracies alive. And I started this paper well before the election in the US and Brexit, but now we think that's even more important. So one thing that's been particularly contentious for a lot of the newspapers are aggregators. And that's because things like pure aggregators like Google News don't actually hire any reporters or produce original content, but their pages look a lot like the, the landing page of the New York Times. So they, they look like a newspaper, but they don't actually bear any of the costs of being a newspaper. So the question is, are these, is this new thing like Google News a substitute or a complement for newspapers? Is it, is it substituting? The, the, it looks like another newspaper, except they didn't actually do any of the research. Or is it a complement because the aggregator reduces frictions, low, improves search and discovery, and actually gets people to read more news? And that's actually an open empirical question. 
Now, in the long term, the real reason the newspapers don't like these things is they feel like in the very long term, basically, there's something called like brand flattening, where the, 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 as consumers consume articles on an article by article basis, they forget about the brands of the newspapers. And so the kind of reason to subscribe to the New York Times would go down if people forget about the New York Times and just think about this in the articles. So they view their role as, as curation, and if people stop thinking about their brand and just think about the articles, they'll ultimately go out of business. There's been, this has been a big deal in the EU. Um, so Germany actually passed a law in 2013 that said if an aggregator wants to use news content, then they're allowed to, uh, then, then, then they have to pay. So copyright law previously had allowed people, Google News to exist and take these snippets without paying, but Germany basically said, okay, um, you can, you, you, the newspapers are actually allowed to charge, and other, if, they, if, the, if, if they charge and the Google News doesn't pay, it's a violation of copyright. Well, actually, this didn't work out very well. What happened was that Google immediately removed all publishers that didn't give a free license, and actually, it was hard. It, this created just friction in the market. Some smaller aggregators went out of business. Google got more traffic, and nobody got paid. So that was a bit of an of a ineffective policy. So Spain came around and said, we're going to be smarter. We realize there's a prisoner's dilemma problem. The prisoner's dilemma problem is that any one newspaper wants to make their content available for free to Google, because if they don't, the user at Google will just go to another newspaper. Um, but collectively, all the newspapers, if they didn't give their content to Google, then Google News wouldn't exist, and then they, all the people would come back to the newspapers directly. Um, so Spain said, we're not going to allow in this prisoner's dilemma problem to happen. We're only going to allow industry-wide negotiation, and there won't be any free licenses, and so maybe we'll avoid the Germany problem. So Spain passed the law, and the next day, Google uh, shut down Google News in Spain. Um, rather than do the licenses. And, and for that matter, so did other aggregators that had the same model, such as Bing News. So I'm going to use, and then Europe, Europe has been considering a, Sp a Spanish-like law for the last few years, but they haven't been able to figure out how to make it work. So basically, I'm going to treat the shutdown of Google News in Spain as a natural experiment, um, and I'm going to look at what happened. So basically, in December 16th of 2014, they shut down, and what I, so, so the way I'm going to analyze this is I'm going to say after January 7th, 2015, everybody settled into a new equilibrium. Google News doesn't exist. And so I'm going to find people who used to be Google News users, but now they've got a new browsing habit. And I'm going to match them with similar people who have the same browsing patterns in this time period, but never used Google News. And then I'm going to go back and say, how did their news consumption differ pre-shutdown? This is a little bit of a weird way to do it. We, you, you can also do the same th similar thing where you match people up in their pre-shutdown patterns but, and then see what happens after the adjustment period. Um, and we actually get the same numerical answers both ways. But we think the way we did it makes more sense because in this setting, nobody's using Google News. And so people with similar preferences are, should be doing different, the same thing in a world with the same set of choices. So this is basically what we get. If we look at, we matched based on this period. This period was not matched, and so it basically shows our matching worked well. Matching, the red is the, um, the treated group, the, the Google News users, the blue is the control group, and they were similar in the period we matched, but they're also similar in the period we don't match when Google used, News didn't exist. And then we look in the period before the shutdown, and we see that the people who are Google News users were actually reading a lot more news before the shutdown, which is suggesting that Google News is a complement. The search and discovery really helped people read a lot more news. If we look and see how they got their news, we see after Google News shut down, the Google News users shifted to direct navigation, so they went directly to big websites. They also substituted to search engines as a way to find news. So then an interesting thing is we now look at how this differs by outlet type. And so we look at how Google News affects top 20 outlets versus below top 20 outlets. And so an interesting thing is that for the below top 20 outlets, the presence of Google News it increases total news consumption, it increases articles read, and it has an insignificant effect, but weakly positive, on landing pages. And so the idea is that you go to Google News, you discover a small outlet, and then while you're there, you might click around and visit the homepage, which is where they make all their money. 
But for the top 20 outlets, there's actually a, a, there's negative effects from direct navigation. Having Google News around makes people navigate less to them directly. And overall, there's less visits to their landing pages, which is where they make all their money. But even the top 20 outlets see when Google News is there, people read more of their articles. But the individual articles aren't as profitable for them. So overall, this leads us to the conclusion that the presence of Google News is good for small outlets, but bad in terms of revenue for big outlets. Um, just to um, conclude on this part, Google News basically increases overall traffic to news publishers, but it's a, a mix between large and small. One of the things we show in some detail is that the volume effect is driven by a reduction in, in breaking news and news that is not well covered by users' favorite publishers. So if there's a topic that an in individual user's favorite publisher isn't covering, once Google News goes away, they don't find an alternative source for that. And as well, breaking news. There's no good substitute. If somebody who uses Google News would see a lot of very recent news. When Google News goes away, they just take longer to find out what's going on. And so that's actually kind of sad for the news publishers because if the news publishers think about competing with Google News, well, what they would need to do is cover everything more and cover things faster. And that's actually kind of a hard thing to compete with Google News, who's just able to look out at everything on the web and as soon as anybody has anything interesting, aggregate it. So there's really no way they can sort of replicate that advantage. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is fake news during the 2016 election. This is a more descriptive paper, um, but I'm just going to give you some of the basic facts about what happened. So uh, first of all, I, I just wanted, the data is coming from internet browsing data, and I'm going to show you, um, first of all, what, what is the political slant of what people are reading, and this is, there's a bu bunch of different sources for this, but we're taking media bias fact check, which uh, judges outlets by their, their leanings. And so if we see what people are reading, this is sort of left center, and so most news consumption is left center. Um, down here is sort of right, and this is right extreme. And of course, in, up here at the very top, this tiny sliver of blue is left extreme. And this is also showing there's, there's actually just more right extreme news out there than there is left extreme. Um, when we look at just overall news consumption, it actually varies a lot with demographics. So old people read a lot more news overall than young people, and it's, it's pretty monotonic. Um, News reading increases and then decreases with income. So it's people in the 100 to $150,000 range that are sort of doing the most news reading, um, it's like spending the most time on the web. Okay, now I want to come to factuality. Again, this is judged by media bias fact check. And so what I do is I take the people and I put them into buckets according to the, their political orientation. So I look at what they're reading and I see are they reading left or right stuff and then I'm going to look differently at the, the, the red line are people who read mostly right-wing stuff. The orange is they read center-right, light blue is center-left, and dark blue is left. And then I break things out and I look over the election year in terms of the, the factuality of the news. If I look at the high factuality news is over here, low and mixed, and fake over here. And so what I'm seeing is that over here for the, the, the people, um, for the, the, uh, the left uh, people, we are seeing mostly high factuality stuff. But if I look at the right people, up to 10 to 12% of the news they were reading during the time up to the election was fake. Okay, and fake is like fake, fake. Like, like there's a prostitution ring in the basement of a pizza parlor, fake. Um, uh, okay. So we also, we, we try measuring this, well, let me, let me just skip that in the interest of time. So now I ask, where did people get this news? And so I, using my web browsing data, for some people I actually have kind of a hard time figuring out exactly how they got to a source, but then for about half the people, I can trace through their browsing and understand how did you get there. So the big blue is, is mostly stuff I couldn't figure out. Among the people where I could figure it out, for high factuality news, they're, go, they're directly navigating to the sites or they're using search engines to get there. If I go to the actually fake news, by far the biggest source, known source of fake news is social Facebook. 
So basically, Facebook was the referral source for most of the fake news um, during the election. And then if I break that out by the political orientation of the people, I can see that, and this is like a time, each of these little boxes, this is like time series during the election year. There's this group of people who are right-wing people, and they're getting a, a lot of fake news from Facebook in particular um, during that election. Then they're also getting, you know, over half of these people's news is lower mixed or fake, and lower mixed factuality news is like really still like pretty bad, um, bad quality stuff. So although fake news overall was a small phenomenon, there's a set of people who seem to have really been impacted by it and were really consuming that um, to a large degree. Um, we, then we try to break this out and understand how, what impact it could have had on the election. Fake news was pretty low by, for, for blacks, but then for and across the board, no matter what state you lived in, but for whites, if you were in red states, you might be having a pretty big share of fake news um, and then it, it declines, um, but there was still a, f a fair bit of fake news among swing states. We also um, looked by age, and we also see that fake news, the share of fake news is really high for the old people. So this was also kind of an old people's phenomenon. Of course, the old people, also the young people don't really read news to start with, um, but they were reading less of the fake news. Um, it, income surprisingly had less of an effect. The last thing we try to look at is, the, is fake news and, and vote share. So this is pretty weak evidence because we just don't have a lot of data points. But subject to those caveats, we do see that the more, and we break this out into pivotal versus non-pivotal states. So pivotal is one where the vote share was close. We find that um, the change from 2012 to 2016 is positively associated with fake news. And we also look at voter turnout. We do this by city. And we find a sort of very noisy and weak, but, um, but you know, present negative relationship between voter turnout and exposure to fake news um, by at the city level. Although, again, this is pretty noisy. Um, so, uh, and, and, it, and it seems to be stronger for women and stronger for Hispanics. So as in conclusion, I would just um, want to highlight that aggregators and intermediaries have a really big effect. Um, they really can determine what you read. It's pretty hard to find really bad stuff. Google actually looks at the, 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 how, how uh, reputable the website is. Facebook shows what people share. And it's not their job to decide if it's good or bad. And so that was the main place people found this really fake stuff. Um, and, and broadly, you know, the impact of these intermediaries could be good or bad. I mean, in some cases, you know, if you really didn't like the big outlets, you might be really happy that you discovered all this good stuff uh, that, that people were sharing with you on Facebook. On the other hand, if they're sharing a lot of false stuff, um, then, it, then we might really have a problem for our democracy. So overall, we need to really keep studying these, these markets and understand them one by one to really predict the implications for social welfare and quality. Thanks. So I'd like to thank uh, Susan for that great talk. Um, obviously, it's very uh, kind of uh, mind-blowing, astounding to actually think about how much the economic landscape has changed uh, via the advent of new de technologies over the past few years, much less to say the, the past few decades. Um, and so, you know, your, your talk has really given us some great insights into thinking about, you know, not only what has changed so far, but, you know, what is potentially going to change in the future, right? So, you know, again, big thanks for that. Uh, and with that, I think we're, what we're going to do is then uh, turn to the audience then for a, a few questions. Uh, we have a good half hour for this. Uh, so if there's any brave first takers, well, that's quick. <laughs> so um, we have the, the mic runners. So please do kind of delay or wait until they get to you. Uh, and then have a go. Thanks. Um, when it comes to fake news, can you comment or help us understand uh, Wikipedia? Because it does rely on citation and non-original research. 
and fake news being imaginary definitely is original. Uh, and I don't know that people were linking to Facebook pages during the election or more recent things um, as opposed to anything else. Uh, if you can help us understand how that's changing. Yeah, Wikipedia is a, a really fascinating case study because, of course, I think all most economists would have said it shouldn't exist and then it should fail. Um, and I do think it actually is having a somewhat more trouble today in the more crowded landscape of all you things you can do on the net and all the places you can find information. So it's interesting just that Wikipedia manages to maintain quality, you know, for the most part, through peer review and you know, sort of active moderation. Um, so it's, of course, it's not really as much of a wild west as it might seem. Um, in terms of the role of Wikipedia in the election, um, you know, I ha actually have not studied the extent to which fake news made it onto Wikipedia and how long it lasted. It's not something I heard a lot about as being a thing, but you, you might be aware of some information that, that I'm not. But generally, I actually Wikipedia, when in, my, in some of my other research, we used Wikipedia as a way to understand like the news that was coming out. And actually, it's, it's kind of surprising how much news is actually covered in a pretty high quality way on Wikipedia as a general matter. All right, any other brave volunteers there? Actually, I'm sorry, they want you to wait so they can get oh. it on the video. Hey. Regarding the first study on ride hailing, you showed yeah. that Uber drivers drive safer than taxi drivers. Yeah. And I have a follow up question. Uh -huh. Can you show in your data about how experience matters there? Like most of the Uber drivers that I meet, they ask the question, how long do you do that job already? And then typically it's like two months or four months, uh, it's pretty short term. Uh, you had more than 8 million, I think, ob uh, different driver observations. So maybe on that small subsample of long-time drivers, if there are any different behavior than long-term taxi drivers, or if the two populations between taxi and Uber drivers converge after a while. Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I don't have as much history on the taxi drivers, because most of the taxi drivers are doing most of their rides outside of the Uber app. So we haven't, that was why we didn't focus in on that question immediately. I can look within just the population of Uber drivers and study those as a, kind of a supplementary fact to understand what's going on. We, I actually, I don't have that number off the top of my head. What I do know though is from my colleagues' studies, and maybe you've seen this too, my colleagues, um, Paul Oyer and Rebecca Diamond have a paper looking at d the behavior of Uber drivers. And they ask a different question, they ask, um, what, what accounts for the wages of Uber drivers, the hourly wages. So the hourly wage depends on the price while you're driving, but it's also dependent on whether the driver actually drove to the right place to start with. Like, if, do you go to the airport? Do you hang out by the movie theater? You know, where do you go to look for rides? And so what they found there was that there's actually a big experience premium for being in a, a, a highly profitable Uber driver. Um, the more experienced Uber drivers figure out how to make more money at it. And in fact, they found there that there's a big gender gap in Uber drivers' wages, um, but it's all accounted for by the fact that there are more shorter term and lower intensity female Uber drivers, uh, which goes back also con is consistent with this idea of the flexible Uber driver, like it's a mom who's got to pick their kids up from school and she's working for two hours in the afternoon and she hasn't like figured out how to optimize exactly the best way to use those two hours. If anyone else is interested, just raise your hands and uh, we'll go and uh, Yeah. Hi. Th uh, thanks for your talk. It was really uh, quite fascinating. Um, can you talk a little bit about this idea of Cambridge Analytica and whether or not the data that you were looking at kind of supported this idea that Cambridge Analytica was maybe uh, attempting to 
weaponize fake news or use it specifically to try to influence what happened in the election? That's a, yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, I would love to be able to, to do that better. So I have the, the data that I'm using now comes from a, a sample of users and it starts to get pr hard to cut it like too finely in terms of different groups. Um, part of what I was getting at at the end there of just trying to, so, you know, assuming that Cambridge Analytica was smart, they should have been targeting, you know, swing voters in swing states and they would have been trying to, you know, suppress the female vote or, you know, by convincing people that, you know, Hillary Clinton murdered people or stuff like that. Um, and so I think, you know, we see some weak but very noisy evidence in, in favor of that, but I can't really prove it at a level of granularity. Um, now, if I had data to do that, I would really want data from Facebook who, who knows who saw the ads at a very granular level. So at some level, I also don't really want to attempt to do that when I know that other people might do it much better with much better data. Um, but I, I think that that's, a, that's certainly a story that's been told and, and insiders that I know have talked about how they, some of these groups got pretty good at, at understanding Facebook algorithms and figuring out sort of how to buy very cheap ad impressions for the target groups and you know, be able to, to suppress the vote in that way. So I would say it's still an unknown and it's, it may be hard for us ever to fully disentangle it. Oh, thank you. Um, I wonder about your personal views about the regulation of the internet. Um, I find uh, uh, we have is a kind of a digital Pareto. Instead of the 80-20 rule, we have a 1-0. It's kind of like Google search or nothing. Like nobody wants to look at Bing. So it's interesting that the European Union is looking at this, but uh, should things like Chrome be banned and have a more uh, fair browser? That's a very deep question, and actually the, the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. is holding a series of hearings this fall about regulating high-tech firms, and, and so I'd encourage you to, to follow those and hear lots of different perspectives. I'm going to be testifying there as well. Um, so what can I say without giving a whole hour-long uh, discussion? So I, I do think that it can be... Um, problematic when a firm is both sort of the, the directing traffic and also the recipient of traffic. And so like the search manipulation I think was a really valid concern and I think it was particularly problematic in Europe because Google had about a 95% market share. So you say, why don't you regulate Bing? Well, like Bing just didn't, was irrelevant there. Like it's most, you know, just people traveling who came from the US doing a few searches or something. So it wasn't really important for the European market. And then if you were the best you know, shopping, search en shopping engine in Spain or you were a startup you know, travel provider in France or something like that, and Google decided not to send you traffic, that could mean the difference between that firm existing and not existing. So, um, and, and then the implication, like you know, if Europe doesn't have any tech companies, you know, that then can affect the next generation of, of investment. Maybe they miss out on the AI revolution because they don't have people experienced in all the things that went into tech companies, which then would, you know, go into, maybe they don't have enough people to work on autonomous vehicles or robots. So I think it really was, is a matter of, of great concern if those companies don't exist, both in the short term and the long run. And so broadly, you know, if I, when I think about how important that is, um, one question I would ask is how important is innovation and how important is R&D? So news is something where you have to go out and rebuild your product every single day. And so if for some reason tomorrow you're not expecting anybody to come to your website and read your news, you have no reason to go and hire the reporters to write the stories for tomorrow. So you know, the quality is incredibly sensitive to how many people you get, and if, and if some of that gets taken away, you won't do the R&D. Um, similarly, like a, a, you know, a website like Yelp or even Wikipedia, 
requires a lot of people to go. Like, who wants to write a review that nobody's going to read? Who wants to make an entry on Wikipedia if nobody's going to read it? And so if those sites lose traffic because you know, people are being redirected to a different service, then those reviews may not get created and all of the economic benefits of having information about prices and quality may not, um, may not exist. So I, I guess I get, I get more concerned about you know, regulation if there's an environment where there's one traffic cup and them redirecting traffic might cause something that's really important to not exist. Um, what you do about it is complicated, um, you know, and that's something that we've all tried to figure out. A more healthy scenario is one where you have you know, multiple, at least two competing platforms who feel a lot of pressure to do the right thing by their users um, and, and, are, and are worried about degrading the quality of their service in order to advantage themselves. But even that competitive pressure you know, may not be sufficient to make sure that these platforms are really, you know, they're, not, they're not generally going to be acting directly in the best interest of consumers. I would also say the alignment of the platform and the consumers can vary a lot from one service to another, one, one industry to another. So something like you know, Amazon or Walmart, a, a, some of those products are very dynamic and require R&D. There's other products that are really fairly static and it's really just about getting the lowest production cost. And so in those scenarios, you know, if, there's, if, if all the R&D is done long ago, we have certain, we, we're buying widgets, we just want a really efficient delivery of those widgets, then you know, the platform may be putting pressure on the suppliers, but that's done in a way that's pretty aligned with the interests of consumers. While you know, for other goods, like you know, maybe books or more you know, innovative products, um, the fear that you, know, you might create a product and then you know, Amazon copies it and you know, directs all the consumers to that product and puts you out of business could have a, a bigger welfare effect. Um, so I would broadly think about these things in, in, from a case-by-case -case basis and the regulation becomes important if it's an environment where there's really important products that might not exist um, or, and might not be efficiently provided if, if the platform um, you know, is, is, is acting too, in a too much of a self-interested way. I'm really curious about one of the conclusions that you draw. Uh, you said that aggregators tend to enable smaller firms to gain market share. Uh, but according to a book by Thomas Piketty, Capitalism in the 21st Century, he collected uh, data and gathered, and he analyzed data over several decades. And his conclusion is um, in the 21st century, we have a more, because of concentration of wealth, and mono so you have more monopoly. And um, I'm just wondering the discrepancy between your conclusion, what I see in uh, reality, for example, in uh, book uh, publishing industry in the US, the big firm, they have the capital, they're using the leverage of cap big capital to buy out and consolidate the smaller firm. Another example would be Facebook, uh, they had the money, so they use that money to buy Twitter. Twitter. So I'm just wondering what your, what your thought on that? Well, so I think they change industry structure, and actually, I think it's, it's a pretty complicated dynamic. So the platforms, first of all, the platforms themselves, there tends to be like one or two, and maybe three if you're lucky. So, and that's the, for a whole bunch of reasons, you know, indirect network effects, more buyers, more sellers, more sellers, more buyers, economies of scale, research and development, um, and, and a you know, variety of other factors. So we tend to see a lot of concentration in the platforms themselves. And so the power of those platforms is of course dr grown dramatically. In the presence of that power, an existing industry will tend to bifurcate. So if you're a, the, the platform tends to enable very small sellers to, comp to compete, and so you can get a rise of very small entrepreneurs. In the case of books, that would be individual people publishing their books on Amazon, which of course creates an enormous amount of social value because we can have all sorts of content creators at very low cost um, getting their content out to people. Um, on the other side, because of the, the power of Amazon, the big publishers actually have an incentive to get bigger because if they're big enough, then they have some bargaining power against the platform. 
And who goes away are the middle-sized intermediaries because they really have no reason to exist. And I would say that's a similar thing with the limo drivers. You know, you have these middle-sized lim limo drivers and companies and they go away and then you get these small firms uh, competing, but maybe there's still some national brands that corporations use when their people travel across cities and those still exist as well. And you've seen in the hotel industry, the hotel chains have consolidated also to get more par power against Google. Um, and, and you know, really a, a reason for their consolidation is bargaining power against platforms. On the other hand, you've had other hotels decide to go independent because they can acquire consumers independently. So, and of course in news it's the same thing. We have this whole proliferation of tiny outlets that can throw up an article today, but on the other hand, a lot of medium-sized newspapers have gone bankrupt. Well, yeah, that's a, some people have written, you've probably seen in the newspaper, there's been some interesting discussions recently from an antitrust perspective about whether we should prohibit big tech firms from buying startups. That's also a really complicated issue. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll refer you, they're having a whole FTC panel on this, I'll refer you to that discussion um, to, to flesh it out, it's a, it's a, it's a complex, uh, scenario, but I would say that you know the, the young firms certainly want to have the possibility of being bought out or else nobody will invest in them. On the other hand, they indeed may be the biggest source of competition for the big firms. So is the trade-off. Right, so another question? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask if you have any recommendations for younger researchers without your reputation about how to you know, really develop relationships with the businesses who have these data sets that you use and whether there's any sort of, um, you know, possible downsides to it in terms of the integrity of your research, maybe getting muzzled or otherwise. Yeah, so let me take the second question first because that's a, a, a really important question to address is, you know, what does it mean to do research like with Uber data? So there, there are a lot of, I think, best practices about working with these tech companies. Uber, and, and it, you know, depending on the sophistication of the company, you may or may not have an easy time following them. So Uber actually is doing a lot of academic publishing, so they've developed processes, and basically, once you've proposed the project, they make a commitment you know, not to censor your results. So if there's censoring going on, the censoring is happening sort of at the project proposal you know, stage. And you know, they surely, you know, I, I might not, I might not even bother asking them if I could write a paper, you know, showing something very negative about Uber. Um, I, on the other hand, you know, that type of censoring has, goes on pretty much everywhere. You know, it's in, in principle, you can always get government data, but in practice, you know, they can make it easier or harder. So if you want, go on a study school quality, you're more likely that the superintendent of a high quality school is going to give you the data to study school quality than of a low quality school. And so we have those kinds of biases. They're really pervasive um, when you think about it. And so what we can do about that is you just, you want to kind of pick questions where the answers are interesting, even conditional on whatever selection that has gone on. Um, you know, in this case, I think if I did the study on Lyft, I would get the same answer. I mean, this, I, I think anybody who's actually ridden a bunch of cars kind of sort of already knew this answer. Um, anyways, uh, so I, I, I wasn't worried about my own integrity proposing this paper because I felt like it would be a pretty believable result and at some level, you know, it's, it's pretty objective what the results are. Um, I worked at Microsoft for a long time and I helped researchers try to do research with Microsoft and I generally there tried to direct them away from problems where I thought Microsoft had a strong interest because I felt like you know, I, I wasn't gonna let somebody write a paper on whether or not Microsoft Windows had market power because you know, if they found they didn't, you would think they had no integrity and if they found they did, it would be bad for Microsoft and so you know, what was the point really of trying to promote that kind of research that would have an intrinsic conflict. Um, Uber has actually been very brave because they've invited people to come in and work on problems that really are policy relevant and I think there they just really believe 
that if people understand better what they're doing, that that, that will be some, there may be some good, some bad. If there's bad, they'll try to fix it. If there's good, you know, it's more better that more people understand. But they've actually taken really a lot of risks in that regard. Um, in terms of like how do you get these, these opportunities, um, you can apply. So I think, first of all, you know, I think working with tech companies is incredibly interesting. So for all the young people here, like whatever you do, you have no excuse to take a boring job. Um, the world is full of interesting jobs. There should be no more boring jobs. Everybody that has a PhD that, or everybody that can do something with data, there are problems out there, incredibly important problems that need your skills and you can make the world a better place by applying them. So don't do anything that's not really impactful. Um, then, you know, how do you get there? Well, I have an article I just wrote for the Journal of Economic Perspectives. It's not published there yet, but it's out on, on the web um, where I wrote about uh, jobs for economists in tech and, and, and tech firms. And so there I talk a lot about the content, like what are all the different kinds of things you can do, whether it's working on designing experiments or working on estimating causal effects using applied micro skills or you know, thinking about designing markets and setting prices. So I go through all the stuff that tech firms do, and that can give you a sense of where there would be an interesting project from the firm perspective. Um, in terms of actually getting out there, there's lots of internships. You guys don't understand, these firms are so desperate for talent. You know, they're hiring, like they wanna hire machine learning people, they cost a zillion dollars, they quit, they can't find them. They are just desperate for talent. And if we can just get some, you know, economists and people from other disciplines just a little bit up the, the, the technical curve in terms of programming and something else, you know, actually the skills that social scientists and business people bring are incredibly valuable, especially if you just hired a bunch of engineers who don't understand business problems, you know, don't know that demand curves slope down, you know, don't, don't know how to, don't, haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the business and economic problems. Um, so actually there's a huge demand. Um, there's a job fair that the National Association of Business Economists is holding in San Francisco next month. Um, they have, uh, you know, about 20 employee, employers coming, including Amazon and Google and micro, I'm not sure about Google, but Microsoft, um, Zillow, uh, Lending Club, where I'm on the board, is, is gonna go. And they, they're really excited to find talent. Um, so you need to code. You need to learn some data science skills. Uh, you need to spend a little bit of time to learn engineering and machine learning lingo because that's the, the lingua franca of tech firms. Um, but that's, those are actually not hard to learn at all. And you know, then you can apply for internships and so on. So what, one way students can do this is do internships. Now, if you're not sexy enough to be, attract the attention of Facebook and Google, don't despair because there's a whole bunch of, of startups who, who are losing out on all the talent to the big firms, and they're really desperate because they also don't have any money and they can't get talent. Um, and so, you know, talk to your friends, like, it's, you know, network, um, and, you know, find some small company that, you know, is, would really, really value in anything you can give them, and then you can develop some skills which then could be taken to, to larger firms. Uh, just a few other little points. There's also like publicly available data sources. So like I'm using data from Comscore for this analysis. Um, there are other large scale data sets that you can get your hands on publicly that help you hone your skills, which would make you more attractive um, to the tech firms. And then there's companies like Facebook that are taking um, proposals to do research using their data uh, as well. All right, I think we have uh, time for one final might be from, uh, okay, sure. Uh, wait, but there's one up front here too as well. <coughs> All right, I'll try to be short <laughs> yeah. for the next one. Um, just a quick question. When you were using the data uh, analysis for Uber, is there a reason that you were not using like monetary response? So like tips that are given to Uber drivers compared to ones that are given to taxi drivers as a direct market signal versus like the survey results? Yeah, very simple. Um, so I've been working on this paper for a little while. The, during the time period I was looking at, the tips were not um, fully rolled out in Chicago. And then as they were rolled out, they were changed. The way that it worked changed a few times. But um, one, a, a, a natural thing to do is for me to extend the data set forward in time um, and you know, look at also the tip data. 
Okay, I think we are officially out of time. Uh, but thank you all for your um, great questions uh, and thank for you uh, very insightful answers there, Susan. Uh, and so as a feature presentation kind of comes to a close, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Susan uh, yet again for being here tonight. So applause might be appropriate. <laughs> And so I also want to thank uh, uh, basically the SFU Alumni Association again, uh, SFU BD again, uh, SFU Public Square. Uh, very special thanks to the Bank of Montreal for their continuing uh, financial support. Uh, and also in, in a little bit less obvious of a realm, you know, basically the SFU Public Square volunteers who are here dispersed uh, in your midst uh, and all the event staff that have really uh, come together and made tonight possible. It really would not have happened without them. Uh, and of course, thanks to all of you for attending and participating uh, in a very fruitful and thoughtful uh, manner. So uh, thank you all again. Uh, I now welcome you to kind of head out into the foyer to join us uh, for a reception, for some refreshments, light drinks, light food. Uh, and I look forward to kind of continuing the conversation out there with you guys. Uh, with that, I just bid you good night and uh, farewell. So thank you again. <laughs> <laughs>